It's working now. <coughs> amen, amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is the day of trumpets as uh, per the Old Testament feast. And uh, we see many things that God has uh, done in this prophetic nature of this feast. And so we're going to be looking at uh, what that means for us today. Obviously, we're not going to be sacrificing or anything like that. But uh, we see this day as a special day uh, in, in the Lord's calendar. And so we're going to look at uh, these things today. But we're going to sing a couple of songs about the shadow of this. And the first one is going to be when the roll is called up yonder. We're going to be there. Amen. Let's stand as we sing. <coughs> When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, when the saint of earth shall gather over on the earth, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, yonder. Gracious Heavenly Fathers, we do come to you today. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the shadow that we can see in the day of trumpets in the Old Testament. We can see the foretelling of the rapture in the new. And Lord, we pray that you would bless us as we look into these things and, and look forward to that day when you come, Lord. And we do pray that you prepare us and that every soul be ready for your coming. We pray, Lord, that we would see many souls saved and see many things done for you uh, until and when you come, Lord. Let us be ready. Uh, for that day. Lord, we pray that you bless in this service today. We pray and bind anything that would try to cause hindrance and loose the Holy Spirit of God to work and to lead and to, to teach us in all things that we need to, Lord, that we might be drawn more closer to thee in all things that we do. We thank you, Lord. We do love you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, let's sing another song this morning. <coughs> he keeps me singing. It's yellow. There you go. <laughs> Amen. What key is this for the F?
right, let's take up our offering this morning. Who's up now? Is it you and is it Bobby and George? sick but uh, it's the dust we got um, with the dust all in the back room there the last two weeks it's been just a lot of lot of dust and a lot of long days and it's just kind of caught up with us so it's not a, a sickness it's not contagious it's just all the dust that we ended up getting so but poor Bobby's gotten hit with the, the lot of the most of it I think it's just because she's she's down lower as the air must be clear up top so you can imagine if Shabba had been here <laughs> You want to sing with us? Praise 
ain't no grave Can't hold my body down There ain't no grave Get old Can't hold my body down While spraying in the garden What do you think I see? The Messiah praying, Father, let this bitter cup pass from me. He said, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. The hour is now come, so glorify your son. There ain't no grave, gonna hold my body down. <clears throat> there ain't no grave. Turn the mic up for me a minute. Early the next morning, before a condemning man, you may destroy this temple, but in three days I'll rise again. There ain't no grave. It's gonna hold, hold my body down. There ain't no grave. It's gonna hold my body down Well they led him up to Calvary and they nailed him to a tree and all my sin was paid for by the blood he shed for me to see if he was dead <clears throat> they pierced him with a spear this was the son of God the soldiers cried with fear then Joseph took his body and they laid him in the grave. Pilate said, Watch, because of Jesus said, There ain't no grave. It's gonna hold, got all my body down. There ain't no grave. <clears throat> it's gonna hold, got all my body down. <clears throat> now at the Sabbath ending, when the sun had fled away The time of fulfillment Three nights and three days The ground began to tremble And the watchman fell as dead The angels told the stone away And Jesus came more like he said There ain't no grave It's gonna hold It's gonna hold my body down There ain't no grave It's gonna hold body down Then early in the morning as the sun came to arise the women came unto the grave and there to their surprise there was no body laying and the stone was rolled away all that ever saw was grave clothes where Messiah had been laid some disciples came on running and some and John did enter in He believed in what he saw But others had not seen The angel said to Mary Why seek the living among the dead? Jesus is not here For he is risen like he said There ain't no grave Good old, good old his body down There ain't no grave Good old For the sight the Savior appeared to many, seen alive by many men. Then he left them with his promise, I'll soon come back again. Now many sleep in Christ, but they took Jesus as Lord. They died in faith with promise, clinging to his word. They so close your eyes in death, and they lay you in the ground. For just a little longer you will shout when the trumpet sounds There ain't no grave Get old, get on my body down Oh, there ain't no grave It's gonna hold, got on my body down Oh, there ain't no grave And no Amen.
ain't no graves when I hold our body down. Amen. <coughs> now, if the Lord comes, we're still alive. We'll just go anyway. We don't have Amen. to worry about the graves. Amen. Amen. All right, let's sing our last song this morning, which is uh, Power in the Blood, I think. Nothing but the blood. Yeah. Top. Quick. There you go. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, we'll cue in. <coughs> you make me a cup of hot water, please? No, Just. Okay. Hmm? no, no, I don't. Amen. <coughs> all right, all right. Praise the Lord for his goodness. Amen, amen. So it brings us to Yom Teruah today, which is our, the day of trumpets. And if we read in Leviticus chapter 23, oh, Joshua, run, get my Bible. It's on the top there. If we go to Leviticus 23, we'll see a bit about, I'll talk to you a little bit about the Day of Trumpets. No, just a little one, it'll be fine. Uh, uh, we'll talk to you a little bit about the Day of Trumpets, and we'll see what, um, what the significance is for us, and uh, what, uh, what it means uh, in, in uh, the New Testament, what it means to us in this day and age. You know, we'll see a lot of things 
here. And um, we see this as one of the feasts of the Lord. And it's very important, I think, that we understand what the feasts are. Um, because a lot of times we miss out on so much of what Jesus did because we don't understand the feasts. And the Bible says that Jesus died according to the scriptures. Now, when he says that, what scriptures is he referring to? Well, evidently, he can't be referring to the New Testament because it hadn't been written. Jesus died according to what? The Old Testament scriptures. And so when we see, when we understand the Day of Atonement, which is coming up in, a, in, in just over a week, we understand what Jesus did. How that in the Day of Atonement, they had two goats and there was a high priest. And we see that Jesus did all that and fulfilled that day and died exactly in the same way. And why, why did God give these feasts? To show, to be a shadow. The Bible says they're a holy convocation, which means there's rehearsal. So God gave the Hebrews these feasts so that, that when Jesus came, they would understand what Jesus was going to do or what Messiah was going to do and what he did do. And so we've already covered, we've already seen um, four of the feasts this year. We've seen the Passover, which is the day that Jesus died. We've seen the unleavened bread, which is the, when, when he was buried. And we find that first fruits was the, the, the day after the Sabbath, was the first day of the week, and that was the very day that Jesus rose from the dead. Why? To become the first fruits of them that slept. Paul also says that Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So, so his death, burial, and resurrection all occurred according to the three spring feasts. We find on the day of Pentecost, what great thing happened on Pentecost? Find the Holy Spirit came uh, to, to give fulfill, full, fullness to any believer that would ask. And so we see that these last three are the fall feasts, or the autumn feasts, <coughs> as we would call them, also have a significance in prophecy. We see that, um, we see that. and we see that this, uh, this festival of trumpets, this feast of trumpets, is synonymous with, uh, thank you very much, with the Lord's return for his bride. And so we're going to look at that today. But in Le Leviticus 23, let's look at what the Old Testament says, and then we'll see the comparison to the new. In Leviticus chapter 23, and verse 22, chapter 23, verse 22, it says, And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field. When thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, ye shall have a Sabbath, a memorial, of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. <coughs> and I'll just read you another passage from Numbers chapter 29, verse 1 through 6, and it says, And in the seventh month, in the first day of the month, ye shall have a holy convocation, you shall do no servile work. It is a day, day of blowing of trumpets unto you. And you shall offer a burnt offering for a sweet savour unto the Lord, one young bullock, one ram, seven lambs of the first year without blemish. Well, I'm glad we don't have to do that. Amen. <laughs> and their meat offering shall be of flour mingled with oil. Three-tenth deals for a bullock, two-tenth deals for a ram, and one-tenth deal for uh, one lamb through, uh, throughout the seven lambs. And one kid of the goats for a sin offering to make atonement for you beside the burnt offering of the month and his meat offering and the daily burnt offering and his meat offering and their drink offerings according to their manner for a sweet savour, a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord. So not only on this day they had a day of all this, these sacrifices, but being the first of the month, they had a sacrifice for the first of the month. They had the daily sacrifice and they also had the Yom Teruah sacrifices as well. And we'd be broke just buying for the sacrifices. But thank the Lord that Jesus has become our one and final sacrifice. But we can still blow the trumpet, amen? So <laughs> we can still blow the trumpet on that day. And why does this matter? Well, in Jewish tradition, it's believed that this is the day that God created the universe. Now, there are no scriptural uh, references for this. You'll find people term it Rosh Hashanah. Rosh being in head, ha, the, shana, year. Rosh Hashanah. And they say it's the head of the year. Now, the, the head of the Rosh Hashanah is only mentioned one, in the, one time in the scriptures, and that's in Ezekiel. But it's not mentioned here for this. This is not New Year. People will be, you'll, you'll find if, if somebody's a Jew, they'll be saying, Happy New Year, Happy New Year. Uh, and, but their real New Year starts in, in well, March, April on Nisan 1st. This is not New Year. This is Yom Teruah. This is the seventh month. Who, I mean, you don't only have to do a little bit of calculations to figure out that uh, New Year doesn't start in the seventh month. <laughs> you know, 
So it's not Rosh Hashanah, it's Yom Teruah. And uh, the correct, that's the correct name is Yom is day, Teruah, trumpet. So Yom Teruah. And you find that the trumpets and the shofars are played throughout the day. And as we've spoken about the month of Elul, the, the month of Teshuvah, is the month of repentance, where, where repentance was really preached. Where people should, where the Hebrews were to get right with God. If they had problems with other people, they were to try and work those out and try and get things sorted before this day of trumpets. And the trumpet blew every day of Elul, every day of the month uh, leading up to it, blew every day except one, and that was the day before Yom Teruah. It did not blow on that day, so there was no trumpet. Why? So that people would realize that the next trumpet they hear meant that they would put down their tools and come into the Lord's house. And worship. So the trumpet blew to remind everybody, it's getting close, it's getting close, it's getting close. Get sorted out, be, get repentant, get, uh, be repenting of the things that you need to get sorted um, before this day of Yom Teruah. And we see that in today that, that, that there's a real push for repentance, there's a real push for people to get ready because the next trumpet that we hear is going to be the Lord's coming. The next trumpet is going to be this. And now there's a lot of debate about when he's going to come. A lot of these debates. And I'm basically, I'm going to look through these scriptures and pretty much put that to rest today. <clears throat> but this feast uh, in Old Testament times and still today lasts for uh, approximately two to three days, you'll find. So you'll find that it starts on the new moon, which was today. This is the new moon. This is the first month of, of, of Tishrei. Uh, or the seventh month is the first day of the seventh month in the Hebrew calendar. Obviously, it's not in our calendar, in the, the, in the, the, um, the solar calendar, the Gregorian calendar. But it is in the Hebrew calendar. And so this makes it the first day of the month, which is the, the day of trumpets. And then on the tenth day is Yom Kippur. And on the fifth day, it starts Sukkot, which is tabernacles. Yom Kippur being the day of atonement. And uh, when we see that trumpets has two to three days fulfillment and it's because it's what you wait until you see the moon then the, the, it's over now if you study if you look uh, where david uh, said you know uh, when they were going to celebrate the feast and says tomorrow is the new moon in other words they knew when it was going to be and he waited three days until the feast was over and you find through that you can see that they knew exactly when the moons were going to be they weren't waiting for the sliver of the moon uh, to start it they were waiting to see it and when they saw that then the last trump was blown and that meant it was the end of that feast and so we see that with the new testament as well so we have we have so many things uh, that uh, god shows us in this but let's look now at the new testament and let's look and see where we we find um the the the, the fulfillment of this in that because so many things here are 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 pertinent to us knowing the timing of when the Lord is coming. And um, we can study out Daniel and we can study out many things. And there's a lot of study that we can go into this, but I'm going to try and keep it brief and let you do your own study. Um, we're just going to base, the Bible tells us in the, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every mouth be established. So we're going to look at about two or three different passages of scripture to find out when the Lord is coming. But let's start with a famous rapture verse, which is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Nobody can, nobody, um, can uh, people want to say, well, the word rapture is not in the Bible. No, it's not. The word, you can find it's caught up. But uh, uh, it's just from... <coughs> <coughs> it just means to seize. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. <coughs> now remember, we've always said that you, if you cannot find the basis for the doctrine in the Old Testament, it doesn't actually exist. So we need to find, first of all, is there a basis for the rapture in the Old Testament? So let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You say that's the New Testament. Yes, but it gives us a key in here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now here's the clue. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 
and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, there's a lot of people that are going to debate whether this is actually going to happen <coughs> and when it's going to happen. And um, we find that some people don't believe that the Lord is actually coming back. Some people believe it's going to be um, before the tribulation. Some people believe it's going to be in the middle of the tribulation. Some people believe it's going to be the end of the tribulation. And so there's so many, and some people don't believe he's coming back at all. So there's, there's many different viewpoints on this. But I think if we study the scriptures, we find out exactly what he says. Now look at the clue that it says that this we say by the word of the Lord. Right? By the word of the Lord. Now what... When, remember when, when we find something, the, the New Testament um, people referring to... Can you turn it off? I forgot to turn it off. <clears throat> when you find the New Testament writers referring to the Scriptures, what are they referring to? Old Testament. All right? Because why? Many of the New Testament, much of the New Testament hadn't been written. And that that was written was belonging to, to maybe the church at Corinth, the church of Thessalonica. So the church at Corinth probably didn't have the book of Thessalonians and these things. So we say by the word of the Lord. So that means there must be a foundation for this doctrine in the Old Testament. Well, there is. The Bible tells us. Now here he says, he says the voice in verse 16 with the voice of the archangel. Well, there's, there's a good clue for us. And we find, we find that the, the, the King James mentions the archangel being Michael. So let's look up to where we find the word Michael. And we find Daniel mentions Michael a lot. In Daniel chapter 12, in verse 1 and 2, it says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So we see there's a foundation. So the dust, the, the, those that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Right? And Michael's going to stand up. So there we have one verse. Isaiah 26, uh, verse 17 says something else. It says, it's like, like as a woman with child that draweth near the time of her delivery, and is in pain, and crieth out with her pangs, so have we been in thy sight, O Lord. We have been with child, we have been in pain, we have, as it were, brought forth uh, wind. We have not wrought any deliverance in the earth, neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter into thy chambers and shut thy doors about, thyself, about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for the iniquity. The earth shall also disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. So again, we find in here that there's going to be a time of punishment and God's warning people to hide themselves and God's telling them to hide themselves because he's coming to judge. Psalm 27 verse 5 says, For in the time of trouble, time of Jacob's trouble that is, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. So it tells us in the time of trouble, people are going to be hidden in the pavilion. So there we have a first witness from the Old Testament that tells us that God's going to spare people from this time of trouble. That he's going to protect people where? In his pavilion in this way. <clears throat> so there's our first witness. <clears throat> when we see the timeline also of the feasts, we see that we have Yom Teruah, which is two to three days. We have Yom Kippur, which is on the tenth day. Now, if Yom Teruah, the blowing of the trumpets, is synonymous with Christ, the, 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 the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, uh, calling people to, to come and worship, to stop the work and come in, we see that then Yom Kippur represents the, the second coming and, the, the, and, and going into the millennium. And you say, well, there's ten days between. There's not ten days. <coughs> one's on the first, one's on the tenth. But when we see that Yom, Yom Teruah lasts for two to three days, we see we have seven days between the two feasts. Seven days, so we have a rapture, we have seven days of tribulation, the days of awe it's called, and we have Yom Kippur, so we have the second coming. So we see in the timeline of the feasts, 
that God is setting these things up. The days of all, and between Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur, were the time where people that hadn't made their decision before um, Yom Teruah, uh, before trumpet, some, the sages believed that some people's fate was sealed on the day of Yom Teruah, <coughs> and, and some had the chance, had, had these days of all, to get right before God. But then on the day of Yom Kippur, everyone's fate was sealed for that year. Now, that's not what the Bible says. But it's interesting when we compare it that there's, there's going to be people that will be saved during the tribulation. There will be people that will, will come to know the Lord. And so we see that. So there's, there's another witness we have of the timeline of that. One thing that does differentiate the, tri- the, 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 the rapture from the second coming is the wording. The word caught up, harpazo, is the Greek word caught up, and it means to take by force, right? It means to, to come from behind and grab a person and snatch them. If really, if you, if you, in the modern definition of the Greek word, it means to, to snatch them out of hard, harm's way. So the Greek word caught up for caught up, harpazo, means that, that pe- these people will be snatched from harm's way. And so we see that uh, in, in First Thessalonians there. And shall caught up, the remains shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. And the difference is, and we see that uh, like in Acts 8, 39, where the, the Lord caught away Philip. He snatched him away in an instant. Um, Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. And he says, such as one caught up into the third heaven. Again, snatched away. So we see this word caught up, her pants, as a very quick snatching. It's like, you know, just getting out of harm's way. (coughs) (coughs) But we see that at the second coming, there's going to be a gathering. The angel is going to be gathering here. And we see that word is is episynagogi, right? Where we get the word synagogue. And it means a slow gathering together. It's the same word, In Hebrews chapter 10, where in verse 25, it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Now, when we have church, we didn't all show up in an instant. You know, we we didn't all just suddenly leave the, you know, walk out the front door, boom, we're in church. You know, somebody had to drive to Hoyk to get you, Brother Ronnie, uh, and these things. And, and, uh, you know, we, we don't just leave the house and boom, we're already here. You know, we had a slow process in gathering. And the more people there are, the slower it is to, to gather everybody together, coming from these different things. So we see a massive difference in these two words. Right? So also if you read Revelation in context, you can find that the the the, the, sec- the, the Lord the, the rapture and the second coming are two distinctive events. You'll find that, that the bride is, is talked about being clothed in fine linen. And then the next thing you find that the armies are coming with the Lord in fine linen. So some people believe that the rapture and the second coming are the same event. But that means the Lord is to come, pick everybody up, uh, take them to heaven, judge them, give them the white robes, and then come back immediately uh, to, to start the millennial kingdom. That just doesn't make sense in these things. You see that Jesus is coming in the clouds on one hand, and the second time you look at what he's coming, he's coming riding on a white horse. He's coming to make war. He's not coming to pick up his saints. He's coming to do war when we realize that in Revelation. And so we see that. We see that, that in the second coming, he's going to set his foot in the Mount of Olives. At the rapture, there's no talk of him coming to set his foot anywhere. He's going to meet us in the air. He won't touch the ground. And that, so there's two distinctive events. And those words show us the differences, a snatching away, and these two things. <clears throat> now, the Bible tells us, that um, now people say, well, there's, there's got to be a falling away first because Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2 says, That ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letters from us. As the day of Christ is at hand, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not remember ye not that when I was with you I told you these things? And now we who and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So 
Und es gibt ein paar Dinge, dass der Tag des Lord, der Tag des Christus, der Tag des Lord, ist nicht die Rapture. The day of the Lord begins basically with Yom Kippur and uh, going in. And as Peter says, the day of the Lord is, is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. We find that that's what it is. And we find other mentions in the scripture that the, the day of the Lord will last a thousand years. Or that approximate thing. But some people say, well, we have to know who the Antichrist is before we'll get caught up. We'll get, we'll get taken. Well, how is he going to be revealed? It doesn't say that we're going to be raptured before that. It says the day of Christ. The day of Christ is at hand. It said he ought to be revealed before that. Now if you look, he's going to have to go into the temple of God and show himself that he is God. Well, he's not going to do that until three and a half years into the tribulation, as we can study. But we don't have time to cover all that timeline today. But we know that that's going to happen in the midst of the tribulation. <clears throat> But it also says that the Holy Spirit is going to have to be taken out of the way first. So we find that the church age, which started with the Holy Spirit coming, although the church was already established, when the Holy Spirit came, that started, if you like, the church age. And that age will finish when the church is taken and the Holy Spirit, um, the filling of the Holy Spirit, so people will kind of revert back to what it was before the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost. So that ends that Feast of Pentecost. So today we're living, if you like, in the time of Pentecost, the fulfillment of that feast, and the next feast to be fulfilled is trumpets. And the Bible tells us that we're sealed until the day of redemption in Ephesians 4.30. The day of the redemption is when we no longer need a physical body. We want that, and Paul tells us in Romans 8 that we're waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verse 51, uh, tells us that, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall, be, uh, we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. So another uh, instance to saying that this is the last trump, and people... I uh, oftentimes say, well, the last trump talking about the trumpets of God uh, and these things in Revelation, these trumpets, these seals. But the last trump is to end the feast of trumpets. The first trump begins the feast. The last trump ends the feast. So if Christ has come, people say, well, Christ is coming back on the day of trumpets. Well, if that is true, then he would have to come back at the end of trumpets. In other words, it would be the last day of the feast. In other words, it could be tomorrow or the next day, depending on what it is. So, so do you believe that? I said, I don't know when Jesus is coming back. I don't know. You know, if we were adamant that Jesus come back on the day of trumpets, you know, we don't know what day that is. We don't know what hour that would be. I'm not saying he will come back on the day of trumpets, but it would certainly fit with if he, if he died on Passover, buried for unleavened bread, rose on, on first fruits, uh, the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost. It would make sense that. But I'm not, gonna, I'm not a date setter. I'm not going to say that this is when Jesus is coming back. Because I don't know when he's coming back. It might be. It, it, I wouldn't be surprised with all that's going around it. It may be this week. I don't know. Praise the Lord if it is. Hallelujah. <clears throat> so there's another witness for us. Now if we look in the churches of Revelation, which we've been studying, we see another witness here. We see in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, John is told, Write the things that thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which must be, which shall be hereafter. So there's three things that, God, that Jesus himself has told John to write. The things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Well, the things that he's seen, what did John, did John write the things that he'd seen? Yes, he did, because we have the whole book of John. We have the gospel according to John. And what is an eyewitness testimony of what John has seen? That is what he had seen, right? The things which thou hast seen, right? And that's what he's saying. It's past tense. So here's a direct commandment from God for John to write his book. I mean, that, that is just, just phenomenal because we don't really see any other commandments um, other than the things here and some of others that God has told them to write down. 
But we don't see any of the other gospel accounts having a direct commandment from God to do this. But here John records the very commandment that tells him to write the gospel according to John. And so we see that. We see that he is told to write the things which thou hast seen. The things which are. Well, he goes on to write about the things which are. The things that are happening today, he says. And he says, what are these? Because he then goes on to describe the seven churches. He goes on to describe, and as we looked at them, these seven churches are seven ages. And now we're living in the Laodicean age. We're living in a day when the churches are lukewarm. Where they're neither hot nor cold. They've got, they've got some hot, but they've also got some cold. They are there, some of them are on fire for God in certain, in certain areas, but in other areas they've brought in too much of the world, too much worldliness, and so the two things have come together, and it's made them lukewarm. <clears throat> we see in Thyatira, God says, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her, into great tribulation. So God says, hey, these ones that are committing whoredoms with, with this woman Jezebel, which is we see was synonymous with the 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 the, um, the the Babylonian Roman Church. Those who committed fornication, he said, "I'm going to cast them into tribulation." All right? Sardis, much the same. He said, um, "If thou remember, if therefore thou shalt watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come unto thee." So again, this is in Sardis, Revelation chapter three, verse three. Thou hast a few names there, in, even in Sardis, which have not defiled the garments, and they walk, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So here's a reference to the bride. He's saying he's coming as a thief here. Philadelphia. He also says in Philadelphian church in Revelation three ten, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the whole on all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So Jesus is saying, because you've kept this, I'm going to keep you. From that. So again, another testimony that Christ is going to snatch out his bride before this hour of temptation. All right. Laodicea, eight, God's, Jesus says in verse 18 of Revelation 3, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyesalve, that thou mayest see. <coughs> so again, excuse me. Again, John is writing all these things about the things that are. Yeah. Now, what about the things that are going to be hereafter? Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So right there starts the things that will be hereafter. All right. So we've got the things which, which he's seen. The things which are is the church age. The things which carry on, this, this feast of Pentecost. And the things which shall be hereafter. So we know that the snatching away, the things that's going to happen, is going to be the end of the church age. So Revelation 4 starts. So between the end of Revelation 3 and the start of Revelation 4 is when the rapture is going to take place. Because that starts the things which shall be hereafter. What's going to happen. So there's another witness for this. Now, people, are, I'm sure people are screaming, what about Matthew 24? What about Matthew 24? I'm getting to Matthew 24. Hang on. Now, if people, if people would read Matthew 24 in chronological order, they would get it. And they would really get it. Now, the first thing <coughs> that you have to realize about Matthew chapter 24 is that it's in chrono chronological order. In other words, he's laying out the order of things happening. Because people say, well, hey, pastor, one will be grinding at the mill, uh, two will be grinding at the mill, one will be taking the other left. That's talking about the rapture. And say, oh, but, but these things are not going to happen until the moon has turned to blood and, and the, the sun won't show its light. And that's after the tribulation. Pastor, that's after the tribulation. And that matches up with, with the sixth seal in Revelation. Hang on. You're missing out a very important key verse in Matthew 24. And that is verse 15. Verse 15 says, Matthew 24, verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. 
Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world of, to this time, no, nor ever shall be. What is the abomination of, of Daniel? What is that talking about? Well, we need to go to Daniel to figure that out. And Daniel, verse, chapter 9, verse 27, Daniel 9, 27, says, He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Seven years, one week. And in the midst of the week shall he cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations shall he make it desolate, even till the consummation that shall be determined, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So what is Jesus saying? He said, hey, you guys remember what happened with Antiochus Epiphanes? Remember Jesus is telling them, remember that feast of dedication that we celebrate Hanukkah? Uh, Jesus is telling them when, when he was there. Um, Jesus celebrated that too. But Jesus is telling them, hey, this, this all that happened at uh, Hanukkah is going to happen again. That was, a, that was a shadow of the Antichrist. And I wonder if Satan thought that this was his time. I wonder when Antiochus went into Jerusalem, set up the altar, caused, stopped the sacrifice. He's like, hey, hey, this is going to be the Antichrist. Ooh, it's my time to shine. And it's like, no, the Messiah hasn't even come yet. Just, just hang, hold your horses there, Satan. You're, you're not coming until God says, that's it. So what's going to have to happen? The Antichrist is going to have to march into Jerusalem. He's going to have to take over. After he's, after he's, he's, he's done this covenant of peace, halfway through that, three and a half years into it, he's going to go in and he's going to stop the sacrifices. So that means there's going to have to be a third temple. Well, there's no third temple built yet. They're starting to build it. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. Mm-hmm means we're getting close. means we're getting close. But he's going to have to stop. He's going to stop the sacrifices. And he's going to desecrate the altar just as Antiochus Epiphanes did. And just a hundred so years before Christ came. And that, if you read the story of Hanukkah in, in First and Second Maccabees, you'd find all that information. I wouldn't say it's scripture, but it's good history. <clears throat> so that's got to happen first. So let me ask you this. People, people that believe that we're going to be raptured at the sixth seal, that means the sixth seal is before the Antichrist. But here in Matthew 24, that has got to happen first before any of the rest of it can happen. It's chronologically incorrect to say that we can be raptured before the, before the mark of the beast comes in, but yet, but yet we see that in, in based that on Matthew 24. The fact is that what Jesus is talking about, he's then telling about what's going to happen after this. People have already been raptured before Matthew 24. It just doesn't make sense that you could say that the rapture is going to happen down there at the last part of Matthew 24 when, when the desolation has already taken place. The mark is already in, in place. If you're going to believe that in Matthew 24, then you've got to say that the rapture and the second coming are the two things together. The Bible does say that let no man deceive you. There's got to be a falling away first and the man of sin will be revealed. But again, that's talking about what's going to happen in Jerusalem, that the Antichrist is going to set up all these things in Jerusalem. So we see that that chronologically has to, the church has got to be raptured before that point. It cannot be after that point and a lot of people have real problems understanding Matthew 24 just read it chronologically just you'll see what happens and they say oh but pastor what about Matthew chapter 24 verse 29 immediately after the tribulation of those days shall be the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken and there shall appear the sign of this uh, the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Hmm. People say, after the, and that's, you see, it's after the tribulation that the gathering is going to happen. But again, that gathering is not harpazo. That gathering is the slow gathering together. You see? And they say, well, that is very similar to what happens at the sixth seal. Yeah, it's similar, but it's not the same. Now, Brother and Roddy and I, you say, there's similarities about Brother and Roddy and I. 
We both have glasses. Both have ears. We both have hands. We're both wearing a tie. I hope you're wearing socks and underwear. Okay, man. So there's a similarity there, Brother Ruddy. All right. But there's some differences that we can see. We could go through all the similarities. We've got two arms, two feet, you know, ten fingers and, and ten toes. You know, nose, mouth, teeth, tongue, hair, heart, lungs. We can go through all these similarities. And I guarantee we'd find more similarities than we would have differences. But what makes us different is our differences. Amen? You know, you've got a few years on me, Brother Roddy. You know? And I've got a bit catching up to do. You know? But, but um, it's the differences that you look at. You know, one says the moon's going to turn to blood. One says the moon's going to be darkened. So we see there's differences there. But again, it's after the tribulation. And what's that mean? That means that the, 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 the Antichrist has already set up everything. And as we've seen, we're going to be getting out of here before that. God is going to spare us from this thing. Right? So, then the key to understanding Matthew 24 is understand the whole book of Matthew. He says in verse 36, But of the day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the, uh, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not that the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. There shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord will come. See, hey, see, Pastor, this is the rapture. So it's after all these things, this is rapture. Whoa, wait a minute. You're not understanding it. The rapture, we're going to be caught up together with him. Here, the second coming, the angels are going to be doing the reaping here. You see, how do you know that? Because Matthew chapter 13 gives us the answer to why these people will be caught together. Taken to, there's one taken and the other left. Now, <clears throat> if you understand scripture, you have to understand that one scripture will interpret the next scripture in, the next, in that way. So when we see that one is taken, we have to go back and say, what are they taken from? Are they taken as in taken out of danger, or are they taken to be captured? Well, it tells us that. For as, in verse 38, for as in the days that were before the flood, were eating and drinking, marrying, giving marriage, until Noah, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not that the flood came, and what? Took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So the ones that are taken here are taken just like the flood took them away. So the ones that are taken are not taken to be with the Lord. They're taken captive just like the flood took them. So the ones that are left are the ones that are safe. The ones that are taken are taken like the flood took them away. Now, if you want to say that the rapture is, is like the flood wiping out all these people, I, I've got a little problem with that. But it says, who was safe? Noah was safe in the ark when the flood came. And the flood took all these people away, just like these people are going to be taken away. So it's not good. The ones that are taken away, it's not good. You say, but why, why is one taken away and the other left? Surely the one taken away is the one that's taken to be with the Lord. Wait a minute. Matthew chapter 13, verse 37. And he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is what? The end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As, there, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his, what, his angels, then they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them that do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and they shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So the fact that it says the righteous shall shine forth in the kingdom of the Father shows that's going to be the millennial kingdom. But it sees first the tares have to be gathered. So why is one taken and the other left? Because God's taking the tares. God's going to reap up all these tares. And this happens at the second coming. All this is going to be reaped together. And leaving the righteous to go into the kingdom of their father. So we see so many things that this day of, of trumpets, this blowing of the trumpets, shows so much of the forecoming of Christ. 
And I, I hope that today has given you a bit of study, something to think about, to really realize that. But the most important thing is that we are busy telling people about Jesus, about how to be saved. You know, it's one thing for us to say, yeah, pastor, I'm ready to go. Should Jesus come this very day? I know I'll then be on my way. I'm ready to go. Praise God. Yeah, hallelujah. I'm ready to go. But what about your neighbor? What about your friends, your family? Are they ready to go with you? The other thing, too, we need to think about is, is our testimony good enough that if Jesus came today and snatched us out of the way, that our testimony would be remained enough to where people would say, hey, I know where they went to. Oh, they were right. Jesus did come and Jesus did take them out of the way. Is our testimony going to be solid enough for people to say that? I hope so. So let us be telling people, let us really focus. I don't know whether Jesus is coming this feast or he's coming next week. You know, I don't know when he's coming. He says that we don't know when the second coming is going to be. So we're not going to know when the rapture is going to be. He says, but we're not going to be overtaken. We need to, we need to be ready. And it's not a case of us standing around on this on the Feast of Trumpets, standing there going, it's getting cloudy. It's almost midnight. That's not what we're to do. Even the angel, remember when, when Jesus went the first time and he, was, he went up in the clouds. What did the angel say to them? Why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? What are you doing? They said, why stand ye gazing? He's coming back. Get busy. Just really focus. Focus on yourself. Are you ready when the Lord should come? And we're going to look at some more this afternoon as well. <clears throat> Are you ready if the Lord comes? And if you're not ready, you need to get ready. Do you know that you're saved? 100% sure that you're saved? I hope you do. I hope you know that you're saved. Not of works that we can do, but knowing that, that you accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and asked Him to be your Savior, asked Him to forgive your sins and, and save you. If you have done that, praise the Lord. We thank God for your salvation that God has given us. But what about our friends? What about our family? What about our parents, our children? Brothers or sisters? Mm -hmm. Those that we work with? What about them? Are they ready? You know, do people know now people will look at you nuts when you say Jesus is coming back for me. But should it happen in our lifetime? They might think, hey, wait a minute, they were right. I hope we've left a good enough testimony that people will, will see, will understand what's going to happen. But are we ready? That's the most mm -hmm. thing. Is we ready? And what are we doing about it? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we do come to you today, we come in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> And we thank you for this day of trumpets. And we thank you for, for showing us the truth of your word. And we thank you that uh, we know the timeline of your coming. We know what is going to happen. We don't know when. But Lord, we know that we need to be busy. We're not to stand gazing up into heaven, but to be busy. Doing what we've always been doing. Winning souls and, and um, preaching holiness and living a righteous life before you. So that when you come, we will not be ashamed to stand before you. I pray for anyone watching this broadcast or anybody that's going to be watching this at a later time. I pray that each one would listen, understand, and see and be converted from the error of their ways. And uh, if they're not saved, I pray that they would accept Christ as Savior. And if they are, I pray that they're ready for when you come. Lord, be with us. Bless now in this invitation. We give you praise and we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. If you need to come this morning, as we have a short time of invitation, I do invite you to come.
of sin Dear Lord, I've tried Lord, I'm coming now Coming Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we come in the name of Jesus, thanking you for your goodness, for your blessings, and for all your time. We thank you for this day that we can uh, look forward to your coming and, and really get to grips with what is going to happen in prophecy. We pray, Lord, that you would find us faithful when you come. And, and Lord, we pray that uh, each one has gotten a blessing out of that that's been here. Those that have been watching on the broadcast has gotten a blessing. And those that will watch will also get a blessing. Lord, we're so grateful and so thankful. Be with us now and bless us and help us. In Jesus' most precious name, amen and amen. You may be seated and you're dismissed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat>